Well, you know that um, obviously the fall feasts come one after another, like boom, 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 three of them. It starts off in the first of Tishrei, one being a number where God's blowing his shofar because he wants us to be one with him. And then you have 10 days, 10 in biblical gematria, meaning days of completion. You have 10 days to kind of examine yourself and ask the Holy Spirit to give you more or less a spiritual x-ray and see where you are. And then we come to this day, the 10th day where it's complete. And with true repentance and penitence of heart, God will pour out from his mercy seat the rivers of forgiving water, not just living water. And then what happens after that? You have five days, and what's the five for? That's the number for grace. Before you get to party with God on Sukkot and feel his presence once again, you should contemplate his goodness for a good five days so you can come in and really thank him and praise him the way he deserves to be thanked and praised. And that's what you have, 15 days, boom, boom, boom. And the beauty about the fall feast is that it, they haven't come to pass like the spring feast. You know, the spring feasts are memorials, but what we're doing today is a dress rehearsal. You know, so let's just look at what the scriptures say about Yom Kippur. Um, There's not a ton of verses because I don't think God wanted it to be that complicated. I talk to people today, I got to tell you, I mean, I know I choose to be simple on purpose, um, but they are too psychological. There's so much psychology in their thinking. I mean, I don't see it in the Bible. Forgive me. I'm not knocking some of you as psychologists. I'm not saying there's not a place for that. I understand there is. But sometimes I think these folks open a Pandora's box that isn't even there. And sometimes when you go too deep, you know, in the submarine, you got to up periscope a little bit and see what's going on around you. You just got to move forward. You can't keep wallowing in the past. You can't keep making mistakes for your current situation based on what happened to you. You've got to move forward. How many husbands did the woman at the well have? How many? And what about the sixth was, but she had somebody, right? Basically kind of a partner. A life partner, as they call it today. Why get married? I have a life partner. Did you see Yeshua sit with her and go, listen, let's go, over, let's go over husband number three. Let's talk about that. You guys, I'm telling you, 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 you know what? You're messing up. And a lot of you, I talk to you, and you know what? God forgive me, but you sound very confused. You don't sound sharp. You sound confused. Be careful of psychology, okay? The founder of Monday Psychology was a maniac. Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, this is what the Lord says. Adonai said to Moshe, his mediator, okay? In the Old Testament, there was a mediator between God and the people of God, okay? In the New Covenant, not the New Testament, in the New Covenant, we have a mediator as well. We have a mediator. I know people go, well, I, I just go to God. I'll just go to God. The only way you can go to God is because you have a mediator. Don't forget the mediator. Okay, Adonai said to Moshe, the 10th day of this seventh month is Yom Kippur. That has never changed. It doesn't matter if people believe it or not. God said the 10th day of Tishrei is Yom Kippur. You are to have a holy convocation. You are to deny yourself, yourselves, forgive me, and you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. By the way, if you brought an offering, back then we brought sheep and lambs, and I'm sure some of you would, you know, animals that got so detestable to God. Do you know why? They were bringing animals that were detestable. And it didn't mean anything to them. I'm sure if we brought an offering today, somebody would go to the ASPCA and just bring a man mangy mutton here. But today our offerings aren't animals. So if you did bring an offering, there's, I think, offering boxes in the back. Is that right, guys? Is there an offering box in the back? Okay, you are not to do any kind of work on that day, any kind of work, none, because it's your own kipper, it's a day to make atonement for you before I don't know your God. Anyone who does not deny himself on this day is to be cut off from his people, and anyone who does any kind of work on that day, I will destroy from among his people. So. The 10th day 
of the seventh month on God's biblical calendar. I know a lot of people aren't necessarily down with that, but God has a biblical calendar. His calendar is not the Gregorian calendar. Our calendar is the Gregorian calendar, and we live in a society that recognizes the Gregorian calendar. So please, don't tell your boss, I'll meet you on the third day. Don't do that. Because you know what? If you're trying to witness to them, you definitely lost them, because you would have lost me if I was secular. Okay? Even, Even... Nisan was named after a Babylonian god. So just relax. If you're going to go witch hunting, you're going to find that you can't use any product and you can't talk to anybody. So just, I'm, just a word to the wise. I'm just saying. After 31 years, I'm just throwing that out there to you. But on the Gregorian calendar, the 10th day of Tishrei coincides with the date September 28th, 2020. And the day started sundown yesterday, okay? That was Erev Yom Kippur, or the eve of Yom Kippur. Today is Yom Kippur, okay? No doubt about it. God's saying it's holy. This is from his mouth. It's sacred, and it's supposed to be a set-apart, called-out assembly. Now, you're watching online. You're called out. You're here. We're with you. You're with us, okay? It's not so easy to come from North Dakota to, to Beth Yeshua, but Warner Robins, you can make it. It's supposed to be fasting as opposed to feasting. People say, but we're delivered, we're delivered, right? Yeshua is our kapora. Man, just pay attention to what God says. You know, just do what he says. Stop, stop it. One day, one day you can't like fast instead of feast. You can't not party one day. That will kill you? And what's it for? To make atonement corporately. Rabbi, do we wait for Yom Kippur? Of course we don't wait for Yom Kippur. The Bible says we're to repent daily. There's not too many believers that do that, by the way. Just throwing that out there. There's not too many believers that daily repent of their sins. It's a rarity. It's a rarity. But this is a day that God's called out the body of Messiah, not just at Beth Yeshua. No. At First Baptist, at First Presbyterian, at First Methodist, and not just in Macon, and not just in Georgia, and not just in the United States. But in every country in the world where there's a blood-bought believer, we're supposed to be together today and corporately ask God for forgiveness. Guys, look, I'm just throwing this out there. A lot of you are believers longer than me. What would happen if every blood-bought believer united on this day and came before God on their face and said, forgive us, O Lord? The gates of hell would fall apart. So instead, we have these things going on in Washington and and in Singapore and other places where we spend millions millions and millions and millions of dollars putting it together, hoping that people will come and watch. And who always comes? The same people that always come. The people that don't necessarily need to repent as hard as the people that really do need to repent. And we have these meetings with the same people, and we call it the National Day of Prayer or a National Day of Repentance. We have an international day of prayer that God has already ordained and of course do nothing to get here except for a little bit of gas money. You didn't need a hotel, did you? No. Mm -mm. Come on, man. Are those things bad in and of themselves? No. No, they're not bad in and of themselves. But why go with man's plans when we have God's plans? Man's plans, garbage cans. Stick with the script. Well, we've never done that. I don't give a crap what you've done. I never believed in Yeshua growing up in the synagogue. I made a change. I didn't go, well, that was my tradition. We just, Jewish people, I'm an Orthodox Jew. We just don't, he was a good teacher. He seemed like a good guy, but he's not the Messiah. 
I defected? Get rid of your ego. Atonement, let's look at the word so we understand it. Kafar, kafar. To cover, to purge, that's a good one. To make reconciliation. Now you, you know what these words mean basically, right? Spiritually speaking, God's saying to cancel, to pardon, to forgive. That's what God wants to do. He wants us to come before him and he wants to corporately forgive the body of Messiah. He's chosen this day to do that. The all-important concept regarding sin in traditional Judaism, as well as the overall concept regarding sin in the Bible, is that the penalty for sin cannot be excused or overruled. It cannot. In other words, it cannot be brushed under the rug, because if God does that for a moment, then he's not a God of justice. And what do we cry out today? What do we cry all the time? Justice, there's no justice. Our justice system is so unjust. We're so frustrated, right? Got murderers and rapists that are getting just six months time. Like, how does that happen? And so God is a God of justice. In fact, when Messiah comes back, justice and righteousness will be the foundations. There will only be two foundations of his throne that he's going to build his government on, and that government will have no end for eternity. And it's justice and righteousness. And because God doesn't change, he's a God of justice, so he can't sweep it under the rug. No can do. So what does the Bible say? Somebody's got to pay. You got a mortgage, either you pay, somebody pays, or else that home is taken away. So it has to be transferred. It has to be transferred in order for it to be satisfied. Somebody's got to pay. You've got to satisfy that debt. That's what they call it in the financial world. That debt has to be satisfied. If it's not paid, it's unsatisfied. So there needs to be what's called a zorbach that every religious Jew knows what that term means. A zorbach is a sacrificial, innocent victim slaughtered as a substitute. Does that make sense? I mean, if Yeshua wasn't the most innocent victim slaughtered, I know it, it looks pretty in the movies. It was disgusting and deplorable. Now, there is one chapter in Leviticus 16 that gives the details of Yom Kippur. And I, I've taught on it so many times. I, I don't want to do that. Not because I don't want to do that. I'll do whatever God wants. But it seems like that's not the direction this is going in. Okay? Forgive me if I'm off. You might have come and said, I really want to learn all about Yom Kippur. Go home and read Leviticus 16. One chapter. But I want to highlight one thing because in those details, there's really one main feature. And that's this, the sacrificing of two goats. Right? There's two goats that are sacrificed on Yom Kippur. One is called chatat, which just is the sacrificial goat to wipe out debt. There has to be a sacrifice for sin. Somebody's got to pay. The other one is Zazazel, and that is the scapegoat. And they would send the scapegoat out, lay hands on it, to transfer. That's why we lay hands. I don't need to lay hands on my kid. It, it's not like, okay? That stuff went out when Benny Hinn retired, all right? And thank God he was forced into retirement. Just as a side note, for all you hoodoo gurus, he doesn't have one legitimate medical miracle on the books that can be attested by the medical community. And if some people were healed, it wasn't because any power from him, it was power from the healer, and God did that because of that person's faith. Because if there's one man who has healing and that man dies, we're all going to be very sick. But there's a healer who doesn't die, and there's a healer who heals.
you put hands on just to signify. You're saying, God, this one, this one. And you put hands on the goat to say, transfer this and get it away from the camp. And you send it out. And of course, the scapegoat is going to be killed. The scapegoat will be killed. But you're sending it out of the camp because what are you sending? Not the sin, the guilt of the sin. The sin won't kill us. It's the guilt that will. It's human nature. We stay guilty for way too long. Look, if you're a recovering Catholic, you know about guilt, but let me just tell you something, Catholic. You ain't got nothing over the Orthodox Jews. We invented guilt. You came in at 500 AD. We, we've had guilt for way before you even thought of Catholicism. And it's easy to make people feel guilty. But a good person doesn't need somebody to make them feel guilty. They feel guilty enough. When somebody messes up, you don't have to tell them. I think they know. Who tells you when you mess up? Your neighbor or the Holy Spirit? Leave it alone. You're not the judge and you're not the jury. You're a witness. Let's take a look at this in kind of New Testament terminology here. John 19, we're talking about the crucifixion, obviously, verses 31 to 34, it says, it was preparation day, and the Judeans did not want the bodies to remain on the stake on Shabbat. Now, was it the seventh day Shabbat? Anytime there's a holy day, it's a Shabbat. When, when Darren was saying Shabbat Shalom, because he's so used to saying Shabbat Shalom, and then he kind of caught himself, but then he said, wait a minute, it kind of is a Shabbat. It's not kind of is a Shabbat, it is a Shabbat. Any kind of holy day that's called out by God, where there's rest is a Shabbat. So what was this day? This was the coming into the 15th of Nisan. If you check your Bibles in Leviticus 23, that was the day that started the Feast of Matzah, and it was a Shabbat. Because some people think, oh, that was Passover. If it was coming into Passover, then he didn't die on Passover. He died before Passover. But he did die on Passover, Nisan 14. And towards the afternoon, it was coming into sundown, Nisan 15, and it was a holy day, a consecrated day, a called out assembly, and so they couldn't leave the bodies on the cross. So what do they do? They break the kneecaps. Because the way you die from crucifixion is asphyxiation. Because you have to push yourself up to get a breath. And if your knees aren't working, you can't push yourself up to get a breath. So that's what they did. So they asked Pilate to have the legs broken, and the body's removed. Listen, we're coming into a holy day. They didn't care about him that much. Him, the thieves, it doesn't matter. Who's ever on the cross, just get him off. It's sacrilege to have them on a cross like this when we're coming into a holy day. Boy, did they not miss the forest for the trees? Man. The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man, so there was three being crucified who had been put on the stake beside Yeshua. Then they broke the legs of the other one. Obviously, they were still alive. But when they got to Yeshua and saw that he was already dead, they didn't break his legs. Obviously, to fulfill prophecy, right? Because the lambs on Passover, none of their bones could be broken. And we have a few, we have a few doctors here, right? A few doctors here. And a few people that think they're doctors. And the real doctors know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, I read in the internet, really. Well, I went to school for 22 years. See, doctors like me. But then I got to straighten them out on insurance areas, and they don't like me so much, you know? It's okay. Um, it is possible, it is very possible that this spear would, would, would miss the bones, no? It's, is that possible, doctors? That it could have went between... The bones, so some people say, well, well, the spear had to do it. No, no, no. But the spear would go across the plural space, correct? Am I right? Doctors, just give me an amen. To the pericardium. And if the pericardium sac wasn't punctured, there would still be blood from the lung vessels and the lungs itself, correct? Okay, so the pericardium didn't need to be punctured, per se, for blood and water to still come out. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that this is legitimately, because sometimes, you know, people like anti-science. No, science corroborates what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't corroborate science. Okay, you can be a scientist and be a devout believer at the same time. They're not enemies. 
So they asked Pilate to have the legs broke. Soldiers came, broke the legs of the first man, put on the stake. Then the legs of the other one, when they got to Yeshua, he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers stabbed his side with a spear, and at once blood and water flowed out. And I think that the order is crucial. I don't think anything that God wrote in the Bible is haphazard. Not nothing. We have some English teachers, too. That's a double negative, I know. I know some of you were like, I, I, just, can't, I just can't believe he did double negative. Not nothing in the Bible. I'm going to do it again and again. Because I'm from the Northeast, and we love double negatives. So these soldiers were well experienced in these matters. They were experts. They were experts at torture. These weren't just a couple of like guys who they just picked out of the crowd. Hey, you want to? No, these were experts. They worked on human beings constantly, constantly to find out. This is what they were looking for. How can we make people suffer with the most intensity for the longest duration. And they found that crucifixion is the winner. Crucifixion is the winner. There was no possibility of his being in a faint or a swoon. They're called resurrection myths. I got news for you, forgive me, but you gotta have more faith to believe in the myths than the actuality of what took place in the event. He was already dead, so they didn't need to break his legs, okay? But we are not told why. No one in the scripture will be told why the soldier pierced his side. But if I had to venture to guess, if I had to venture to guess, I would say it's ungodly hatred. It's what we have today. When we wish politicians death, I'm not political. You know why? Because I've already voted for my king. He's been my king for 31 years. Okay? We live in a beautiful country. Where we get to vote how we want. And how do we vote? Selfishly. But it's okay. That's a democratic republic. You get to vote for whoever you want. But to wish death on somebody, listen, Christian, that's ungodly hatred. That's disgusting. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's deplorable. And this is what this guy had, ungodly hatred. He had wickedness in his heart. So out of the frustration that this lunatic didn't get to inflict pain on this person that he could care less about. It wasn't Yeshua to him. It wasn't the Messiah. It wasn't the Son of God. It was just a guy that was convicted of some crime. Blasphemy, but he wants to get his hands on him. Son of a gun, he's already dead. Frustration. Just frustration. Which only shows the wickedness of his heart. And then blood and water came out. Not water and blood. Oh, what's the big deal? Everything's a big deal. Everything's a big deal. Who do you say what's a little deal and what's a big deal? What do you know about what's a big deal and a little deal? If it's in there, it's a big deal. Because this parallels Chetat and Azazel, spoken of in Leviticus 16. The first goat is Chetat, the sin, the blood. It had to be sacrificed. Then, once you pour out the blood, then you could take away the guilt, not before. Blood and water. Look at what Hebrews says. And who are we talking to? We're talking to Messianic Jews. And all those grafted in, but that's who the letter is written to. And basically, you know what the letter says? Don't throw out the baby with the bath water. You know what I mean? Let the sacrificial system go down the drain, but don't let the feast go. Now every Cohen, that's the high priest, that's not the Levitical priesthood, Every Cohen stands every day doing his service. He doesn't celebrate Yom Kippur every day, but if you know about the everlasting sacrifice in Exodus, there has to be a sacrifice in the morning and the afternoon in the temple, in the Holy of Holies. Every day that happened, every day. Offering over and over the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. What? No. Now, when you do something awful and you say you're sorry to somebody and they go, it's okay. You still feel dirty. Still. But this one, after he had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. The ministry of every Aaronic priest is now, in these two verses, sharply contrasted with that of Messiah. There was no chair in the tabernacle. Nope, there was not a chair in the tabernacle or in the temple. Not one to Aaron's priesthood. 
You know why? Because the Aaronic priests had to stand daily in the performance of their duties. There was no rest because their work was never completed. Now, I don't fault them. This is the system God set up. He was building something. It was a present progressive revelation. And it started in the beginning, God. And it finishes at Revelation 22, 21. When all things will be restored and made new. It's this progressive revelation. It's not like they were wrong. I'm not making fun of them. I'm not poking fun of my people. They were doing what they were told. I applaud them for their obedience. But no, they couldn't rest because it was never complete. The sacrifices were repeated year in, year out. Year in, year out. It was an unending routine which basically left sins untouched and the conscience unrelieved. Not so with Yeshua's sacrifice. Look at one verse in John 19.30. After Yeshua had taken the wine, he said, it is accomplished. What is accomplished? And then he gave up his spirit. Mission accomplished. The work that his father had given him to do was complete. And what was that work? What did he say? Make it simple, guys. Stop delving into the internet. How much knowledge do you need? You guys have so much knowledge than my friends in Africa and India, and they're banging on doors every day, doing exactly what Yeshua told them to do. Yeshua said, I've come to seek and save the lost. That's what he said. You want to know why he came? He came to seek and save the lost. And then he had to save the lost through his sacrifice, and when his sacrifice was done, that's when he said, it's finished. Now the loss can be saved. It's done. Mission accomplished. Therefore, the work of atonement and redemption is complete, and it is not once upon a time. It's for all time. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a fairy tale, although the knight will come on the white horse and take his bride away, into the sunset, and they will live forever, happily ever after. And that's coming. That's what these fall feasts are all about. Our redemption draws nigh. Hebrews 10, 19, 20. It says, so brothers, based on everything we just read, everything I've just told you, so brothers, we have confidence Listen, guys, there is a huge chasm of a difference between confidence and arrogance. Huge. We have confidence to use the way into the holiest place, the holy of holies, opened by the blood of Yeshua. That's what our confidence is in. He inaugurated, he set forth a new and living way through the parachet, which is Hebrew for veil, by means of his flesh. Now there is no caste system any longer. No, nope. no rich, no poor, no highly educated, no not so educated, no white, no black. Get the news flash, no white, no black. You know, I don't know, I, I, I pray all, all the time that we'd be one. We're one of the few in Macon that, that have diversity. Not enough as far as I'm concerned. But I pray. Maybe instead of praying for diversity, you know what I should pray for? You all to be colorblind. This has all changed through Yeshua's sacrifice. And the way was opened through the veil, which had to be rent or broken. And this, of course, refers to Yeshua's body broken in death. The original pillars in the temple, the two pillars, the Jews called that the legs of God. The veil was his shirt, but he sat like this. So if I sit like this, these are the pillars, and this is his shirt. When Yeshua was sacrificed, do you know why that veil was torn? Because God mourned, like Jacob mourned for Joseph. Nobody sees it. They think it was so easy. It says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord to sacrifice his son. 
so that he would see his offspring. Man, the price that was paid was priceless. And that's why we repent. Because it's through repentance when we're forgiven that we realize, oh my God, you love the world this much. How dare I abuse this gift of redemption. It draws us closer and more intimate to God. It doesn't draw us away. Repentance is beautiful. God had set up this system so that he could be more intimate with us and we could be more intimate with him. It's his system and it works. It works for me all the time. But wait a minute, Rabbi. Time out. You're talking about Yom Kippur. Then all of a sudden you move on to Yeshua's sacrifices are Kippur. I thought Yeshua died on Passover. Not Yom Kippur. And if that was your thought, you're right. He did die on Passover because Passover is personal. Everybody needs their own lamb. You can't, my kids can't get in on my lamb. Won't work. They need their own. Kippur is corporate. So, you know what? Let's get back to Kippur. I wanted to show you that, yes, Yeshua is our Kippur. He's our covering. But he's our Passover lamb. Yom Kippur is different. In 2 Chronicles, chapters 3 through 5, King Solomon completes the Lord's temple. That's what happened. The Lord asked him to build a temple, told David, I'm going to have your offspring build it. You're a man of war. Those hands can't build my holy temple. And so he said, your offspring's going to build it, and Solomon built it according to everything God told him to do. In chapter 6, King Solomon dedicates the house. It's built. He's got to dedicate it. And he dedicates it as a house of prayer where the people shall meet with God. That's going to be their meeting place, the temple. God will reside in the temple, and they will meet him in his temple. Now let's pick up the narrative here. 2 Chronicles 7. So the temple is complete, and he offers up a prayer of dedication. When Shlomo had finished praying, that's what I just mentioned to you, obviously, in 2 Chronicles 6, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. And the glory of Adonai filled the house so that the Kohanim could not enter the house of Adonai because the glory of Adonai filled Adonai's house. All the people of Israel saw when the fire came down. All the people of Israel saw when the fire came down. And the glory, the chavod, of Adonai was on the house. They bowed down with their faces to the ground on the flooring, prostrating themselves. They gave thanks to Adonai, and they said, for he is good, and his grace continues forever. So the temple of the Lord is complete in all its vast array. I mean, people sometimes will say, why did they spend that kind of money on the temple? Listen, first of all, you need to do what God tells you to do. You don't need to worry about what God tells me to do. And I don't need to worry about what God tells you to do. But that would be the day. That would be the day that my house is prettier than God's house. That would be the day. Solomon messed up when he made his palace three times as big as God's temple. That was his demise. Because he started to get caught up in the house not with God, and it happens to the best of them. The house is dedicated, and God displays his acceptance with an incredible manifestation of his presence. Incredible. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if that happened? It's this incredible manifestation of God's presence which causes the people to worship. Not praise. Praise is easy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, you're always talking. You're always talking. You can't hear God. You know why you can't hear God when you're praising? You're too busy talking. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's like, I know, I heard you 30 times. Give me a chance to speak now. But you can praise anything. You praise your children. You praise pizza today. But worship is for God and God alone.
It's a whole different ball game. And so this presence of God caused the people to hit the carpet. Let's look at the next couple of verses. 8 through 10, so Shlomo celebrated the festival. What festival? I'm sure a lot of people kind of skip over that like it's kind of not important. Well, if it wasn't important, it wouldn't be there. So it's got to be important. He celebrated the festival at that time for seven days together with all Israel, an enormous gathering. They had come all the way from the entrance of Hamat. Where's Hamat? Syria? It's 132 miles north of Damascus. All the way to the Vadi, all the way to Egypt. This is his entire, everybody from the kingdom. This is when the kingdom was full. Egypt to Syria. They all came. Can you imagine? Wow. What a worship service. On the eighth day, they held the solemn assembly, having observed the dedication of the altar for seven days. So they had a feast for the, for the dedication seven days, right? How do I know? They observed the dedication of the altar for seven days and the festival for seven days. So they had two 14-day periods of celebration. Then on the 23rd day of the seventh month, what do we know about the 23rd day? That's Shimoni Etzrit. That's the eight-day celebration. The eighth day. It's, not, it's kind of part of Sukkot, but it's its own thing. After the seven days of Sukkot, I'll, I'll get to it. I'm, I don't want to get this complicated. I'm so not into that. Okay? I'm just showing you where it is. So when I tell you, you won't go, well, how do you come up with that? He sent the people away to their tents full of joy and glad of heart. Why were they so full of joy? They just dedicated the temple. And then they just had this Sukkot of God's presence. And then they go home, like, elated. It's, it's a phenomenal time for all the goodness I don't know he had shown to David, to Shlomo. Now, what do we know about if, if they went home, if they had a dedication for the dedication of seven days for Sukkot, then the seven days prior, since Sukkot starts at the 15th, then that had to coincide with Yom Kippur. It had to, because Yom Kippur is on the 10th. You follow? So if Sukkot ran from 15th to the 22nd, and then the 8th day is the 23rd, and there was 7 days before the 15th, do the math. So was it on Yom Kippur when they all came and repented before God, and that's when the glory of God fell? What say you? Repentance is always a precursor to presence. Now, we're almost done. Second Chronicles 7, 12 through 14. Adonai appeared to Shlomo by night. Now, you guys know this so well because it's been so used. Oh, my. But it's okay because I never abuse it. I use it on Yom Kippur. Now, let me ask you something. They just had built the temple. They dedicated the temple. They had these two worship times, one for seven days, which included Yom Kippur, and one for Sukkot, right? They go home, and then Adonai appears to Shlomo. How long do you think? When you read this, right? Now, you're a Bible student, right? Some of you are, I've been reading the Bible for 40. Okay, so how long do you think? Obviously, you're guessing. Take a guess. How long? Maybe came that night? Yes? Any takers? It's okay. Don't be embarrassed. Maybe that night? Maybe a couple days later? How about 13 years later? Didn't see that coming, huh? Uh A lot goes on sometimes between the verse. 13 years later. Then he appears to Shlomo and says to him, Hey, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the sky so there's no rain, don't give the devil so much power. God's in control, man. Okay? The devil doesn't control the weather, and I've never met Mother Nature. Father God does. Or if I order locusts to devour the land, or if I send an epidemic of sickness, 
among my people. Then, then and only then, if my people who supposedly bear my name who run around calling themselves Christians will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the evil ways. What, what evil ways do we have? We're, we're good people. That's the problem right there. <laughs> I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Just look at the first verse for a minute. 712. The temple is for sacrifice as well as prayer. The Old Testament, which we are in right now, in this section of Scripture, the Old Testament understanding of worship regularly joins sacrifices of atonement and dedication and thanksgiving with prayer. There has to be some material expression of the worships, with the worshipers in a disposition. So they come, they come sacrificing and rededicating themselves onto the Lord and thanking him that he's there and he's listening and he's willing. Thanking him. The next verse, it's obviously a summary reference to the divine punishments mentioned in Solomon's prayer. If you go back and look at his prayer, he's just mentioning what Solomon said. And then 714, that's called the golden text of the entire book. Okay, it is. I know that we've heard it so much like John 3.16, but I, I don't hear it like that. I don't hear it like, oh, yeah, I know that one. I don't know. I never taught my kids to memorize Scripture, that they would come forward and say, Daddy, it says in Philippians, no. I'd be like, who's Philippians? You give me one verse in chapter 4, what happened in chapter 3? Who wrote it? Why did he write it? What does it mean? Put it in context. This, this great verse, this, and this is a great verse, it expresses like no other in Scripture. No other. There is no other Scripture in the Bible that expresses God's requirement for national blessing. It's not open to debate. It's not open to opinion. It doesn't matter what you think. God's doing a new thing. Oh, yeah? What's new? He's not still saving souls and pulling them out of the pit of fire? What's he, what's he doing new? Tell, en, enlighten me. God's always been about saving souls and delivering people. He's always, he is a God of redemption and deliverance. And he's still doing it today. Today, somebody is going to give their life legitimately to the Lord, whether you like it or not. It's this requirement, whether it's in Solomon's land or Ezra's land or in our own. God does not change. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need anything new. Nope. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And people are people, and sin is sin, and deliverance is deliverance. Those who believe, though, must first forsake their sins. They have to legitimately forsake their sins. They've got to turn from their life that is centered on self and yield to God's word and his will. Then and only then will heaven send revival. Then and only then, then and only then will heaven send revival. What is revival? The word is chaya, and it means to be restored to life. That's what revival is. When somebody gets revived... You're bringing them back to life. It's the same principle except spiritually speaking. Spiritually speaking, it's a renewed zeal to obey God. You want to know my definition? That's my definition. And we need revival just about every day. 
just about every day. You, I, any of us need to renew our zeal to obey God. What is zeal? Real simple. Kena in the Hebrew, it means ardor. Ardor. What does that mean? Who knows? Ardor is a fervent, persistent, intense devotion. My definition, continuing in spite of opposition. Zeal is a fervent, intense, persistent devotion, continuing in spite of opposition. That's zeal. That's when a person is zealous. Revival is when God reveals himself in awesome holiness. Not so much love. He reveals him. Revival? Revival is different. Revival is when God reveals himself in awesome holiness and irresistible power. It is when God visits the world of men to impart a fresh vision of his great glory and great grace while he simultaneously reveals man's sinfulness, man's inadequacy, and man's desperate need for his mercy. This is so important to me because I think most people that are crying out for revival don't even know what they're crying out for. God, revive us. You want God to come and reveal your inadequacy? Not necessarily. Then don't ask him to revive you. I'm not poking fun. I'm not being sarcastic. A little bit I am. Because that's my personality. I know a lot of you don't like sarcasm. You weren't raised with sarcasm. But give me a break. A lot of you are sarcastic behind closed doors. You know? I can't believe she's wearing that, bless her heart. Forget that. That's not Yom Kippur. Okay, bless her heart is not Yom Kippur. At least what you get with me, I throw it out there. So you know why you hate me. God visits the world of men to impart a fresh vision, a new vision, a renewed vision of his great glory. And his great grace. Because some of us have been saved way too long. We forgot. We forgot how wonderful it was on the honeymoon. We were just in a beautiful spot, Brenda, that night for our anniversary. And I like to take her away someplace that we haven't been. And we decided to go to Maine. I felt the Lord leading us there. And. It's, um, it could be the prettiest state, without a doubt. I don't think there's another state that rivals it. For just natural beauty, its coast is longer than California's. A lot of people don't know about it, and I think most Maine people want you to not know about it. <laughs> That's why they never talk about it. They don't want you to come. Um, it's beautiful. And New England is beautiful. I got news for you. New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, Cape Cod, Nantucket, Lock Island. Uh, it's, it's, it's a magnificent part of the country, just magnificent. So I said to Bernard, let me take a picture. You got on this cliff, and she just looks at me and goes, is that the way it's going to end? <laughs> and I said, I had my shot 31 years ago. I said, sweet pea, I had, believe me, I had my shot 31 years ago to push you off the Transfiguration Mount. And then the Lord appeared. I was just ready to do it. It was like Abraham, you know what I mean? With a knife, I was just ready to push you, and then the Lord appeared. I was like, Ooh. I didn't do it then. You're safe. I, I threw that in there, I think, because this is such a heavy subject. And, you know, i am I'm really been full of the joy of the Lord for a while now, for months and months and months, just full of the joy of the Lord. And I, I didn't intend, but as soon as I walked in here, I felt the Spirit hit, and I threw it out there, and I was like, oh, man. I had to walk out almost. I was like, oh, man, it's going to be pretty heavy. But... You know, repentance is beautiful. It's so beautiful. I mean, think about when somebody comes to you who you love. Who you love. 
You, you adore them. And that's why when they did something to you, it hurts so much. You know, because supposedly they love you so much, how could they do this to you? Why would they do this? Why would they be so selfish to want their sin more than you? And it just breaks your heart. You want to do anything because it's beyond anger. You just, now what am I going to do without you? And then I got to wallow in the anger forever. And they come to you broken, and they're crying, and they're begging you for forgiveness. It's so beautiful. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like begging for forgiveness, and there's nothing like having that forgiveness extended to you. And that's what we celebrate. Anybody familiar with Count Zinzendorf? Okay, all three of you, good. <laughs> 1700 to 1760, he's born 1700, died 1760. He was a very well-known uh, German religious social reformer. He was a bishop of the Moravian Church. You've heard of John Wesley, right? John Wesley got saved under him. Yeah, he, he thought he was saved. And then he saw the Moravians one day in the midst of a storm. He was on a boat coming back to England, and they were praising God, and he's really, he was panic-stricken. He's like, I want what they have. I want what they have. It's one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world. It dates back to the uh, Bohemian Reformation. 15th century. That was when the Protestant Reformation started, so it's got a lot of history. I'm going to give you a quote of what he said, and I'm probably going to say it twice because to me it's priceless. Okay? Quote, everyone desired above everything else that the Holy Spirit might have full control. Self-love, self-will, as well as all disobedience disappeared and an overwhelming flood of grace swept us all out into the great ocean of his divine love. That's revival. There are many that desire revival to come to America. I, I, I hear it. I don't talk to as many people as I, I used to. I spend more time talking to non-believers than believers because, I don't know. I feel like my time is valuable and it's better spent with non-believers. I personally would like to see revival come to America, but I personally would like to see revival come to Beth Yeshua International. I'd settle for that. Dave, do you remember when I was invited, I don't know who did it, I think you might have orchestrated it, um, to a prayer breakfast when Casey Cagle was running for Lieutenant Governor, how long, that was like when I first got here, right? 2006? I think he became Lieutenant Governor in, in 2007, maybe 2006. And so it was at this, it was at a church right downtown. And I was new. Rose, you were there? Okay, so I was new. And there was about 300 pastors there, right? I mean, and I know what they were thinking. I know. What the heck is he doing? Who is he, you know? Some Jewish kid. We have pastors in this town who have been here they should be up there. I was like, I didn't ask for it. And I was told that I'd have to, I have eight minutes. I have eight minutes. And the crazy thing was, I don't time myself. I don't do that. I don't, I don't do any dry runs, nothing. I don't know how long anything's going to be. But it was exactly, remember? Eight, not 7.59. It was exactly eight minutes. But the message was basically, it brought everybody to their feet. Remember, Rose? They were all, I mean, they all jumped to their feet, all 300 people that were there, and they were clapping and screaming and yelling, and I had walked out, and one of the ladies recognized me, I don't know, maybe from Mabel White, I taught there some and stuff, and she said, Rabbi, what's the matter? I said, eh, it's okay. And people were coming up to me and saying, can you preach that message at my church? Can you preach that? You know what I said. I said, I could, but I won't. That message was for right here. And they, right then, you're done, right? What do you, you know, God forbid you tell a pastor you don't want to preach a message at his church, you know? Then maybe he was wrong, right? And you offended him, and you're done. You're done. So I was done across the board right then. And uh, what's that? Yeah, sure it does. 
And um, so I, I just left quietly. And the lady also then said to me, why are you leaving? I said, I don't know. Kind of preached the message about repentance and nobody repented. They liked the message. It's a great message. Eight minutes, you know, out of Joel. Rend your heart, not your garments. <laughs> author, author, Joel. Joel was the author. I'm being sarcastic. It's sad. It's a sad state of affairs, and that's where we find ourselves in America, in the American church. You know? Big screens, fog machines, and skinny jeans. Don't forget the coffee beans. You got to have them too, right? (laughs) Well, there'll be many people in Orthodox Judaism across the world wearing white today. I remember when I was a little boy, we stayed in the synagogue till about 4 or 5 o'clock. I wasn't eating and drinking. It wasn't. There's no eating. There's no drinking. There's no perfuming, no deodorizer. You look around the synagogue to me at 4 in the afternoon, and you're looking at dressed up corpses. You know, in Judaism, when you're buried, you're buried in a shroud because everybody's equal in death. And so you wear these white linen that you're wrapped in. At that point, if you're a man, your tallit is cut because you don't have any more obligation to obey the Torah at that point. So to me, it's almost like they're dead. You know, right now you guys are deodorized. I know you went that route. And, uh, you know, you're only here for a short time. Everybody looks good. Right? But at 4 o'clock in the synagogue? Mm. Doesn't look so great. Doesn't smell so great. And why do they look like they're dead to me? Because Yom Kippur is a day of death. It is. Death of the old year. Death of the old sins. Death of the old ego. It's a day of death. There could be new life. On Yom Kippur, we're given a second chance. A chance that very few of us can give. We don't forget. We hold on, and we hold on, and we hold on. And you know what else I've noticed in 31 years? You could do so many flipping good things for somebody, and the one thing you choose not to do for them, that's what they magnify. And they never forget it. I've paid people's mortgages, bought them cars, done so much. And the minute they ask me something, I go, we, we, I just don't feel led to do that. Then I'm the bad guy. Man, human beings are rough. They're rough. And they hold on. And they hold on. And they get offended and they don't let go. They hold on and they grab that bait of Satan and they are trapped. If I can get you guys to stand, uh, if you have problems standing, either because you're fasting or because you have an issue, by all means sit. It's not ultra important. But we have a mock sore that I didn't hand out because of COVID. I don't want to be responsible for all that. But um, Machsor is a a life cycle book. And in the Machsor, there's prayers for Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. And I felt very led to lead you in a prayer. And um, I'm going to kind of go slow with it. I don't want you to read it by rote. We we do need some liturgy because I think a lot of us don't, don't think about all the different kinds of sins that we've committed this past year. So I just want you to take time. Um, with it. Um, it's called Alchet. It's a very famous prayer in Judaism. And it Alchet just means for the sin. 
And I did put some things in, in parentheses, some things parenthetical, because, you know, some of these prayers, I mean, they're not made for five-year-olds. So I just want you to make sure of what you're saying. So here goes. We might say it again. I don't know. I'm just waiting on the Lord. For the sin we have committed. No, no, no. I, you know what? I don't want you to repeat it. No, I don't want you to parrot it. I want you to hear it. When you're saying it, you're not hearing it. Okay, this isn't a sing-along. We need to repent. Okay, we need to do Yom Kippur. Okay, and something might come up, and you go like, ooh, I got to make that call. I got to go over and talk to that person. I got to say, you know, when you said to me about my kid, you know, 16 years ago, that kind of stuff, let it go, man. It's, it's a trap, and you're going to get clogged no matter how tight you might think you are with the Lord, it, it's a kink. Not in the arm, it's a, it's a kink. Like if you had a kink in a hose and the water's not flowing strong, it says rivers of living water. Not, not like little drips. Rivers of living water are supposed to flow from us. And where the river is flowing, there's healing in his name. For the sin we have committed against you willingly or under compulsion, and for the sin we have committed against you by hardening our hearts. For the sin we have committed against you by acting without thinking, And for the sin we have committed against you by speaking perversely or corruptly. Body's shaking. For the sin we have committed against you through sexual impurity and for the sin we have committed against you secretly and openly. For the sin we have committed against you knowingly and deceitfully, and for the sin we have committed against you by offensive speech. (laughs) For the sin we have committed against you by wronging our neighbor, and for the sin we have committed against you by sinful meditation of the heart. For the sin we have committed against you by lewd association and for the sin we have committed against you by insincere confession. For the sin we have committed against you by spurning our parents and teachers and for the sin we have committed against you in presumption or error. Just for the record, presuming is declaring something to be true without any real evidence or anything concrete. For the sin we have committed against you by violence and the sin we have committed against you by profaning your name. That even means when you're saying that God said when he really didn't, but you think he did, that's profaning his name. For 
for the sin we have committed against you by unclean speech and for the sin we've committed against you by foolish talk. For the sin we have committed against you through the evil inclination, and for the sin we have committed against you knowingly and unknowingly. That just means bending your heart towards that which is wrong. For the sin we have committed against you by denying and lying, and for the sin we have committed against you by bribery. That bribery doesn't have to be money paid. It could be just showing favoritism. For the sin we have committed against you by scoffing, and for the sin we have committed against you by slander. For the sin we have committed against you in our business dealings. And for the sin we have committed against you in eating and drinking. For the sin we have committed against you by demanding usurious interest by the way the bible says don't charge interest and for the sin we have committed against you by arrogance and pride for the sin we have committed against you by speaking gossip and for the sin we have committed against you by wanton glances. For the sin we have committed against you with haughty eyes, and for the sin we have committed against you by insolence. For the sin we have committed against you by rejecting responsibility, and for the sin we have committed against you by contentiousness. For the sin we have committed against you by ensnaring our neighbor, and for the sin we have committed against you by envy. For the sin we have committed against you by levity, and for the sin we have committed against you by being stiff-necked. For the sin we have committed against you by running to do evil, and for the sin we have committed against you by tail-bearing. For the sin we have committed against you by vain oaths, that's when you say you're going to do something, but you don't do it. And for the sin we have committed against you by hatred without a cause, just not liking somebody because. For the sin we have committed against you by breach of trust, 
and for the sin we have committed against you with confusion of mind. For all these sins, O God of forgiveness, forgive us and pardon us in Yeshua's name. Now there's another prayer I'd like us to recite together. It's a short one. It's in the Machsor. It's a Shamnu, and it just translates as we have sinned. So if we can do this together. We have trespassed. We have dealt deceitfully. We have stolen, and we have slandered. We have acted perversely. We have done wrong. We have acted presumptuously, and we have been. We have spoken lies. We have counseled evil. We have spoken falsely and we have blasphemed. We have scoffed, we have rebelled, we have provoked, and we have oppressed. We have been stiff-necked, we have corrupted, we have gone astray, and we have led others astray. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I could just have you guys sit for a moment, I promise to get you going. Um, if you have to leave for whatever reason, it's not even remotely an issue. Believe me when I say that. Um, look, time is running very short. I know you've heard this for a long time. Some people have said, we've heard this. We've seen plagues in 1900, and I'm not talking about COVID or, or racial issues. There's always been racial issues. There always will be racial issues, and there will always be diseases. I'm talking about the window for people to come into the kingdom is really getting short. The road to destruction is wide, and many will find it. Many will find it, truthfully. There is a stairway to heaven, but there's a highway to hell. And this is, this is life and death. Now look, you might be watching and say, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? You, you're supposed to come to grips with how messed up you are. That's what you're supposed to do. And you're supposed to come before a holy God and say, can you rewrite this mess? And he can. You can't. One of the things on Yom Kippur, do you notice in that little section, Leviticus 23, how much talk is about no work? Don't do any work. Don't even do any regular work. Don't even do any fun work. No work. If anybody's caught working, they're out of the camp. Don't you dare work. Don't you dare. What's the emphasis? No works can save you. You can't work your salvation. But that doesn't mean to be flippant either. Somebody might be here and say, come on, give me a break. You're saying if I just say a prayer, I'm in? Not exactly. It's a good place to start, but if you legitimately want the Holy Spirit to come in your life and guide you, and you legitimately want to try to obey his guidance, you'll be saved. And it doesn't matter what you think about their profession or what you think, because that's how you all started. Where you are today is not where you started. Don't forget it. It's taken you years and years and years to get to where you are. So how dare you tell somebody that wants to come in, it's like you got in by the grace of God, and then you become Messiah's cop, and stand at the door and go, I don't think it's legit. How did you decide that? Why did you decide that? Who told you to decide that? You've got to start somewhere. You can't do this by yourself. It is impossible. I think sometimes we think, no, I got this thing. Ah, shine my light. That light was given to you from the light of the world. It's all a gift from above. Every good gift comes of the Father of lights. Anything that I do good or that looks remotely good is from God. And everything that's bad is from Greg. I take full responsibility. I'm off. I'm messed up. I'm still messed up. But one thing I've noticed. When I mess up, I fess up quick and I recover quick. Ern said to me, she said, come on, you were an exercise fanatic. So was she. That's how we met. And she said, one of the telltale signs of fitness is how quickly you can recover after your heart zone gets whacked. How quick it recovers. That's what it's about. How quick do you recover? 
How quick do you wallow and stay angry? How long? How long? Is that what you want God to do? You want God to be like, ah, I think we'll wait this one out. Stay guilty. Stay miserable. Come see me at the end of the week. Who are you to act like that? Why would you act like that? Is that what you want back from God in kind? So it just takes a person coming forward and saying, I need you to direct my life because I'm a mess. And newsflash, everybody in this place is messed up to an extent. And if you think you have it together, that only proves how messed up you really are. It doesn't mean we're horrific people or axe murderers, but come on. Come on, we could be these sweet, beautiful people, right? Talking to a stranger and in the store and get word of something and lose our freaking minds and become like a lunatic, right? Even for that moment, like temporary insanity. How does that happen? How does that happen? How could a person go from, you, you drive me crazy, I can't stand when you do, and the doorbell rings, I'll get it. How do you do that? We, we, we desperately need the Lord. I'm, I'm telling you, 31 years, and I promise you, I need the Lord. Now more than ever. I realize that now more than ever, there is a short window for America, there's a short window for the world. Okay? On the 10th of October, I will be baptizing people. Why? God told me to. It's the eighth day of Sukkot, Shimoni Etzret. It's a new beginning, and I believe there's people that desperately need a new beginning. But I also believe there's some people, okay, that need to give their life to the Lord. Okay? If that's you, come up here. And if that's you, listen, I know some of you, there's a couple of you out there. I know there's at least two, maybe three. There's at least two, maybe three that's watching that needs to do that. If you do that and you contact me here and you can't afford to get here, I will pay your way to get here for Sukkot and I will baptize you on the 10th of October. Okay? There's at least two, maybe three, but at least two. And you know who you are. Everybody here is good and saved. Everybody here is going to be at the Big Bash. No question at all. You're there. You've made that commitment to the Lord, and you're good to go? We're all good? You sure? Okay, let's stand together. Let's end with the prayer for the Moad, for the Yom Kippur. Do we have that Moad prayer? Let's do this together if you wouldn't mind. Our God and God of our fathers, you have given us this day as a time to examine and judge ourselves, to joyfully bring harvest offerings to you, and to look forward to Messiah's return. We remember Yeshua, our great high priest, who brought his own precious blood, the blood of atonement, into your most holy place. Through his blood, which cleanses us from sin, we now have our consciences purified from guilt and condemnation, and can serve you in love with pure devotion. You will bring this age to a close with a shofar call, heralding a new age. Then nations shall learn war no more. The lion and the lamb shall lay down together in peace, and your name shall be one over all the earth. In that day Israel shall be delivered and dwell in peace, and all the nations shall come to your light. The new Jerusalem and the new temple will be established, with priests and Levites from among all peoples, and from one new moon to another, and from one Shabbat to another, on the appointed season of Sukkot, all flesh shall come to worship before me. Hallelujah. We dedicate ourselves to you today for your purposes as living sacrifices. We consecrate ourselves to you, and we seek your will. Wherever you want us to go, we will go. Whatever you want us to do, we will do. And whatever you want us to say, we will say. If there is anything you want us to change, show us and we will do it. We seek you and desire your anointing, your manifest presence that breaks every yoke. 
Let it rest upon us, and we will be victorious. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take these next five days and enjoy them. Enjoy the peace of the Lord. Enjoy God's goodness. Enjoy God's forgiveness. Enjoy God's mercy. Enjoy God's long-suffering. Enjoy God's patience. Enjoy it all, because he really does enjoy us. That I know. That I know. If he can enjoy me, he can enjoy anybody. <laughs> this I know for true. And then we'll get back together on Saturday. So not only will we be celebrating Shabbat, but we'll be celebrating the start of Sukkot, which is going to be quite the powerful time to be in God's presence and just celebrating that goodness of God. Amen? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Chag Sameach. Shalom. See you in five days.